Good evening and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining this John Smith Centre Power Hour event. This is our seventh Power Hour event and I'm delighted to see so many of you back again. Let me also extend a warm welcome to those people joining for the first time and those who are listening again to the podcast on the John Smith Centre website. We exist to make positive case for politics and representative democracy here at the John Smith Centre and we do that in three key ways. We do that through research, studying attitudes that the public have towards politicians and the public servants. We do that through advocacy, events like this, showcasing the very best of what politics has to offer, and also through our internship programmes, trying to pull down the barriers that too many people face accessing politics and elected life. The Power Hour series is designed to take a different look at an aspect of power in every session and discuss it with a special invited guest who is a real leader in their field. This evening we're going to explore the life of a new MP, Wendy Chamberlain, who was elected to the UK Parliament for the first time in December 2019. She was the only person to win a seat from the Scottish National Party that night, turning a majority of two into a majority of 1300 on a night which also saw her own party lose its leader. In the next 60 minutes we're going to look at Wendy's early career, where she's worked in the police and in military resettlement before looking at her work on the Scottish Affairs Select Committee and life as a new MP in the midst of a global pandemic. In the final third of the evening, we're going to explore some topical issues with Wendy, including justice issues and electoral reform. But throughout this session, we also want to hear from you. So thank you to those people who've submitted questions in advance of tonight's event. I've got all of those in front of me and I'll do my best to weave them into the conversation that we're about to have. But you can also ask questions live on the rolling basis as this goes along. If you're not familiar with Zoom, you can see at the bottom of your screen in the middle, there's a Q&A function there. If you type your question into that and hit send, that will come through to the team here at the John Smith Centre and we'll make sure that we factor that into the conversation that we're having. So let's get cracking and let's meet our first guest. Wendy, welcome. Tell us, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Um, I wanted to be somebody reading the news. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> A TV broadcaster, a newsreader. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't necessarily think I would be on the side where I was making the news. Sorry, that was just my husband at the window about to walk the dog. So, um, uh, yeah, so that was kind of what I had an idea that I'd want to do. And when we did our sort of work experience in fourth year, as it was in my school, which was Greenwich Academy, which I think is also the alumnator of uh, Ronnie Cowan, uh, as well as uh, Ross Finney and uh, Annabelle Goldie, um, I went to the Herald for a week. So, yeah, I was quite serious about it for a period of time. And so what happened in your work experience week? Did that put you off it or? No, I really quite, in, I really quite enjoyed it. Um, I think the most exciting thing that happened there was a, the Glasgow Jazz Festival was on and I think I went along to, to that. Um, but uh, I think once and I went to, it's English was my degree at university at the University of Edinburgh. So I suppose I was still thinking about it potentially in the background. But when it came to it, I ended up uh, taking a different path. So why study English? Was that another passion, reading literature? Yeah, so um, I've, I'm a voracious reader. It's one of, my, one of my big regrets. It's like I am that, that pain in the neck mum to my kids. You doing? Done anything? I was sending my daughter Caitlin Moran excerpts this weekend, trying to kind of pull her in. Um, so yeah, it was very much a uh, first love, you know, still, you know, my summer holidays. I've got my big pile of books that I've been trying to get through and I uh, did have a real passion for it as well as for, for, for theatre. So um, my husband would rather um, cut his arm off than go and watch a National Theatre Live thing. But uh, <laughs> that's the kind of thing I would like to do. And I did some amateur dramatics, both at school and at university. I was listening to Val McDermott at the Edinburgh Book Festival this week and she was saying that politicians who read fiction are better politicians because fiction gives you a better understanding about the power of empathy. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right to you or? Is... I think you can be empathetic without it but I think there is that for me and I suppose this goes back to my kids as well there is that bit around losing yourself in a book and that imagination and and what you want to make of it is is very very powerful. So you do English at uni and then what happens? So I do English at uni and during that time I'm working throughout in, well, it was Willie Lowe's 
in uh, Edinburgh's Nicholson Street when, when I first had a really nice salmon outfit which then became Tesco's, Willie Lowe's was brought, brought over by Tesco's and so by the time I got to my final year um, I was looking at what I was going to do and I was persuaded to apply for their kind of graduate programme and I think I got down to about the last 100 in the UK, I remember going down to Liverpool for an assessment centre and one of the tests was around, you know, it was basically you, you're the acting manager for the day and there was a series of unfortunate events were taking place in your store and there was just a moment where I just thought I want to something to care about a bit more and it was interesting because the feedback I got was you were great and then you just seemed to lose interest over the two days and that was when I started seriously thinking about um, something in the public sector and my father was in the police and uh, so I'd done some engagement around their accelerated promotion program and uh, made my application from there. You weren't political at uni in any way, you weren't involved in political societies, societies or clubs and stuff? Um, no, I did try. So I had uh, done a crash hour in modern studies um, in my sixth year and when I went to Edinburgh I had tried to do politics as my outside course in first year but it was oversubscribed and I had a director of studies who wasn't up for breaking the rules and um, so no I didn't get to do that and then I have to admit sort of part-time work plus the university footlights first year show the best of all right in Texas kind of kind of distracted me so no I wasn't somebody who was I've always been interested in politics but I wasn't somebody that was active and, until I joined the Lib Dems. So you and we'll come back to that because that happened kind of much later much on. Much later recently. And, yeah so you, you go into the police and you do um, 12 years in the, in the police is that right? Were you yep. a particular type of police officer or, or, or how does that work? Like so I spent my um, first years um, operational uh, during my training at the police college. So I worked in Wester Hales um, as a response officer for my first couple of years and then moved into Haymarket and I had a foot beat around uh, Gorgie and, and Fountain Bridge. Um, and then I, after that, I was in child protection for a period of time um, and that was... Um, that was clearly a, an, an area of, um, of policing that's very sensitive and you know saw a lot of, saw a lot of things uh, there and I had got married at that point and found I was pregnant while I was having my daughter so I was at, uh, and I was having my daughter so I ended up doing all the research for when children are on the at-risk register it was ensuring that the police information was available for meetings to agree that so um, it was uh, you know it was, it was quite difficult and then after I returned from maternity leave I went into police headquarters and started on the sort of HR L&D journey that I was that I was on until uh, December last year. So um, worked um, for the Association of Chief Police Officers in Scotland, which was when we had the forces in personnel and training business unit. So we do stuff with the police um, negotiating board, for example. Um, and then latterly was at the Scottish Police College. So the, the move into kind of the more HR side of, of things, did, did that also take you to the job that you did in the South Dockyards? Because you, you did a job around, and uh, maybe you can explain to us what this involves, military resettlement. Is that when people leave the forces? Yeah, yeah. So um, the MOD contract that out and it's an organisation called uh, Career Transition Partnership, which is run by the right management manpower group that you might recognise from a recruitment perspective. And absolutely what that is, is about supporting uh, service leavers uh, in, in to, into employment so depending on the length of service a service leaver has from whichever one of the services it is they are entitled to job seeking and resettlement support so I worked at MOD Caledonia and Resyth that was after a two-year career break after leaving the police and so as my role as employment and training manager was one coordinating and ensuring that the employment opportunities were there for people to apply for because we had a sort of free job finding service so it was good for organisations too but also ensuring that we were ensuring that they had the training training that they needed and um, to sort of civilianize their qualifications and, and make them be, um, better easier uh, easier for them to transition. So you're really working up close and personal with with people at that stage proper one-to-one -one advice? Yeah yeah absolutely so um, you know people who and, and I think this is really important to remember this, the vast majority of people who leave the armed forces go on to, you know, full, full employment and really finding that employment is actually one of the key building blocks for leaving the services because if you have a job then potentially you've got locations, you know where you're looking for housing, schools etc etc but you were working with people who potentially had more difficult experiences so the personnel recovery unit for example and uh, you know quite tailored in, in the approaches that we would give. I was on the more general side of things but all those kind of bits linked in. So then how did you go from that to working for Diageo? 
So um, Diageo were one of the one of the employers that we worked mm -hmm. with. They had been in touch because they were looking for those with an engineering background and had somebody within Diageo who um, his husband had been in the services. So I think that was what had made the connection for them. And then um, when the MOD contract was changing, my role was, was going within that. And although I had secured a role to stay within the, the military settlement, I did think that if part of my job is helping people find jobs, if I can't find one for myself, there's something far wrong and it is about that hidden job market so literally here's my dad Diageo contract here's my CV I'd love to have a chat so that's how that came about. And I, I, I read many interviews that you, you've given um, this afternoon but in one of them I'm sure it said that um, whilst you're at Diageo you, you got a distilling certificate that you're, you're certified to, to make gin is that true? <laughs> so yeah so I have from Institute and Brewing Distilling I have my general certificate in distilling which is um, often used by people at sort of senior operator level within distilleries. So you wouldn't leave me in charge of anything, <laughs> but from the training that I delivered, which was on the manufacturing and supply side of the business, if you're doing work around, um, you know, the DMAIC process, which is, you know, the, the, the pr process improvement, if they are talking about short and long fermentations, it's pretty handy to actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> And you've got that in your back pocket in case this politics thing doesn't work out, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, also <laughs> handy for whiskey and gin tastings, definitely. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a really varied um, kind of career already there. And, and you're still very young to be a, a, an MP. You might not feel it in the middle of it, but I think, I think that's a yeah. typical reality. Yeah, I had a year as a further ed, I had a year while I was in the police, I did a year of in further education as well, delivering communications. Uh, uh, skills at uh, Fife Col what's now Fife College. So yeah, I've done quite a bit. But it's also, if you, if you don't mind me saying, in, in a bit of a pejorative fashion, um, you know, the police and the armed forces are, are not necessarily vocations that people would automatically associate with Liberal Democrats. So like, how, how did you find your politics or what, what took you to the Lib Dems? What, what's the value set that underpins that? Or maybe they're not connected and, and you can tell us why you're well, a Lib Dem from a different perspective. Yeah, so I suppose I, I certainly always voted Liberal Democrat. I think the only time I didn't was I voted for Margot when I was uh, um, just after university. But um, I think part of it was, so Greenock is, is where I'm from. I'm at that time. Um, you know, Labour in, in certain places in the west of Scotland could almost weigh their vote. Um, but my parents sort of had looked to my, my father's father was, well, he says that his father was a liberal, but not like I am. <laughs> but right. so I had a little bit of that, that tradition and there were, you know, liberal Democrat councillors in the west at, at end of Greenock that, that, that my, my parents knew. And then um, in terms of policing, I suppose for me there's that do no harm principle isn't there so um you know I, I don't believe that we can much though we might like the idea of a utopia a living society where there isn't you know some set of principles and standards that uh, we should try and adhere to as a society and you know for me it's very much about helping people um that, and that sounds silly but you know actually when people have said to me about being an MP the surgery aspect of what you do there of speaking to people finding out what their issue is looking to what their expectations of what they're expecting you to do as their representative and then being realistic about what you can do is a wee bit like going to calls yeah. as, as a police officer because very often what somebody has contacted you about isn't necessarily what, what the real problem or issue is. I'm going to come back to um, a lot of the kind of political issues around um, justice a, li a little bit later on, because in the context of party politics, whilst I, you know, I was clearly a former Labour politician, I always found myself on the wrong side of my party on justice issues and much more aligned with a very liberal perspective on those issues. But they're hard to argue for. And I want to explore some of that mm. uh, with you in, in a bit in terms of the current kind of media climate that we're living in. So you were, you were always a, a Liberal Democrat. That's kind of in the blood. It's in the family and all the rest of it. You don't join the Lib Dems until 2015. So to go from joining to, to being a, a member of Parliament in, in four years, I mean, that is a sensational kind of rise. How did Particularly that come about? Particularly, did I say it, I suppose, for a Lib Dem. <laughs> um, yeah, so, me, me. <laughs> so for all I said that it was in my family, my parents are, are you know, my, my father's um, been, has voted Conservative for, for a number of years. And, and part of that was around the changes and improvements to police 
uh, pain conditions uh, that, that came in during the 80s. I certainly remember being told that. But yeah, so I'd always voted Lib Dem and when I left the police in 2011, I did think about getting involved and I actually, I think I had a coffee with Willie, Willie Rennie. And then to be honest, I think, you know, the reasons why I'd left the police, wanting to have time with my family, etc., kind of took over and, and maybe I chickened out a wee bit as well. And then basically independence referendum happened. My husband was, was very involved uh, on the yes side. He'd been a member of the SNP since he'd left the police in 2011. And I suppose I was quite a typical no voter in that I didn't, you know, kind of hid my light under a bushel as it were. And then the general election in 2015, and, and I say jokingly, you know, crying at Nick Clegg on the telly, but there was that bit of feeling that uh, the Liberal Democrats had really, as small, smaller parties and coalitions often do, had bear, borne the brunt uh, of, um, of, of the result. And that if I, seriously, that was where my beliefs and values lay, that I needed to do something more than, than sort of complaining about things or, or feeling bad about it. So um, I joined a couple of days after that. Just for the benefit of people watching, Wendy and I met up for a, a, a coffee not that long after you got elected so that I could try and convince you to be one of the host uh, MPs for one of our internship programmes here at the John Smith Centre. And it was over that coffee that um, I discovered that your, your husband was an SNP supporter and an SNP member. And um, some people will know that my partner is an SNP politician. So we had that commonality of uh, having a household where, where political opinion is divided. And I get asked about that so regularly so yeah. often how do you do it people sort of squint their eyes and look at you funny like you're an object in a zoo how does that work well and to me it's it's quite it's quite natural it's about having respectful dialogue respecting somebody else's opinion even if it's different to yours and it's something that we try to promote here at the john smith center but how does it work in your house like do you, do you talk about independence do you talk about constitution do you have the same old fight or do you try and leave it alone how does it work because I, I know people are fascinated to hear us yeah. Talk about this. yeah so it's interesting because as well as that when I mentioned my husband would never go to National Theatre Live the friend that I go to for that is actually a councillor an SNP councillor in Midlothian so it's not just uh, from that perspective so I suppose how I've always looked at it is that in many ways my husband and I want a number of this or want a number of the same things I suppose I would say I was more on the left of my party I would describe myself in some respects as a social democrat but I suppose we just have different ideas about how best to achieve that um, and that's certainly how I look at it I won't lie and say that it's always easy um, I, I don't know how it is, it, it is for you Kezia but uh, it, it is about you know I couldn't be doing what I'm doing currently if it wasn't for the support of my husband in terms of you know managing managing things at home. So that might mean that we don't follow one another on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but but you know I'm hugely grateful to to, to him for for um, the support he's he's given me. Isn't it interesting how like not engaging in t on Twitter is one way to have a more respectful dialogue and, and to keep the peace? I think there's something quite important about the damage that Twitter can do in a really binary way that polarising yeah. people and pushing, pushing them into opposing uh, camps. Um, thank you for uh, being so honest about that because you know we don't often talk about people's personal lives but I just think in the context of kind of respectful dialogue it, it is really interesting yeah. to hear you talk about I that. I think the reality is is nothing is binary is it? You know yeah. nothing is, is binary and actually our systems and you said we're going to talk about electoral reform drives us towards that and, and it's about finding areas of consensus sometimes. 100% and we will get to that. So the, the, the final question I have for you before we move on to what happens when you stood for Parliament and the work that you're doing as an MP now is really to ask about another interest that you have in your life which is Shinty and, and you have quite a kind of prestigious honour in that regard you know you're the first female trustee or board member of Cabin Act. Yes. tell us what yes. that is. So my father's from Tynebrook in Argyll and uh, so I basically grew up, in fact I was even on an episode of Take the High Road because I think that was being celebrated its anniversary a couple of weeks ago when there was a, a shinty match between uh, Glendarroch and a neighbouring village and uh, Morag scored the winning goal and my dad was on the Glen Glendarroch team. So he played for a team called Kyle's Athletic which is one of the big shinty teams. Um, amateur sport played by about 4,000 people, um, mostly in Scotland, but there are teams in California, down in uh, Cornwall, the English Shinty Association operates out of there, and uh, my grandfather was chieftain of the Act Association uh, when I was a, 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 a wee girl, and um, yeah, so 
there's a team, one team, there's a team at the University of St Andrews, but there's also one team in Fife called Aberdour. And uh, once we found that there wasn't one, a cl club too far away, took the kids along and just got completely uh, souped into it. So my husband's now the chair and the coach. My kids both play. And uh, because of that sort of shinty heritage that I had, um, I was invited to join the board of the Cameron Act Association and became its first female director uh, back in 2017, though I stood down just before the, the general election. Um, yeah, it's, um, I think it was a really important milestone. Um, there's been another, at least another two women since um, I, I took on. Uh, took it on and I think actually the growth in the game that we are seeing is driven by the, fe the, by the female uh, game uh, to a large extent so um, and for me you know to have that game continuing is, is, is absolutely great. It's amateur sport, anybody can do it and it does look a bit, a bit scary. I think my son once described it as ice hockey with no ice. <laughs> yeah I saw that in one of your interviews and I was like hang on a second is that not hockey but then yeah but but if you think about it, the ice hockey is is actually comes from shinty. So when people left Scotland to go to Canada, they played shinty on the ice, and it became ice hockey. And in fact, the uh, Canadians refer to uh, ice hockey as shinny. So it's all all interlinked. And we play annually uh, against Ireland. So it's a hurl, hurling um, shinty international. And for the last couple of years, uh, Scotland has, has been triumphant, which has been good as well. well that's good in any sport, I think. We can, yeah, <laughs> we absolutely. Can There's not many we can say that. So um, you join the Liberal Democrats in, in 2015 and you, you, you meet Willie Rennie and have coffee with Willie Rennie and he's encouraging you to, to stand. I think you stood in Stirling in 2017, is that right? Yes. Uh, and then stood in, in, in North East Fife or Fife North East as it's so often described <laughs> uh, on, on the BBC in, in 2019 where you're up against Stephen Gethins. Um, who at that time was the foreign affairs spokesperson for the SNP and on, on the telly a lot, quite a well-known figure and you had a majority of two. But when you were selected, did you think you were going to win? Were you running hard at it? Did you give it everything you've got? Or, or what was that like at the time? Because it was such an, in many ways, expected uh, but, but surprise event that general election. Everybody sort of thought it was coming, but when it was announced, it, it really shook everyone. Yeah, so I would just go briefly back to 17. So when the snap and, and it was announced in 17, for us, for Lib Dems, because it had been Ming Campbell's seat up until 2015, it was an all-women shortlist for us. So there was a real effort to get women engaged and interested. So Willie had contacted me and asked me to think about it. And, um, and I did, spoke to Keith and thought, well, I have no expectations here, but it'll be a useful experience to see if it's something I would actually want to do. So I thought I'd just get on the bus and see how long it was before I get chucked off. And um, so although I obviously wasn't successful there, it meant that, you know, I became better known and more active and, and supported the campaign in North East Fife because realistically Stirling was was what we would call a paper a candidacy where we, you know, we didn't have, have expectation much in the way of expectations of progress. So that did mean that when North East Fife came to reselect, having come so close, um, I was in a I was in a better position because I was I was well known and had continued to support the party locally, so I was selected in June two thousand and eighteen, okay. and very much because it was our top target seat in the the, the whole of the U, the UK. So, yeah, I was running at it for for a very long time because, as you know, you know after the seventeen election, a, a minority government there was there was talk of there being a general election every five minutes, and you know I have to say that Diageo as an employer were incredibly supportive because you know I had a, I was able to have an honest conversation with them filled out a career break form that's the first line says you know when do you want your career break I don't know how long for I don't know that either and are you going to come back I don't know that either so yeah so um it, I have to say it was probably a bit of a in some respects it was a bit of a relief because um I had been juggling work because my work sometimes took me over to art to Dublin for example you know Diageo uh, operates uh, Guinness over there and so I was trying to do that and canvas and occasionally see family so in some ways just having the campaign to focus on was was uh, was was a relief and yeah um Stephen well I think you know it comes back to that respectful politics Stephen and I got on very well there's lots of issues where where we agree and I think 
we, you know, both set a tone, I wouldn't mind you saying that, to, you know, that was the way that we conducted ourselves. And as a result, I have to say, I, I you know, I'm very, I don't know if that makes me fortunate or, or otherwise, but I really didn't experience a huge amount of, um, of very negative, uh, negative things. But what was weird was because it was two votes, because it was so marginal, was the amount of press interest, which was something that I hadn't been, been, you know, subjected to or aware of before. I think there was one day where we had CNN in the more, I had independent, I, then CNN, then the New Statesman, and then uh, the Times all in the one day. And it was literally to the stage of, um, have I said this to you before? <laughs> and we were in St Andrews as well, and it felt like every door that we knocked was an American student who couldn't vote. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so much to unpack in that. I mean, not least the fact that I mean, you were selected a long time out, um, relatively speaking, before the, the general election took place. And you've talked there about you know, how important or how critical it was for you to have a supportive employer. A lot of people don't have that, and a lot of people don't have that time or the support networks that, that, that you, you clearly have in, in order to stand for office. And that's a, that's a huge problem putting off, as we know, largely women from even considering standing yeah, for office. Yeah, I'm very conscious of that. Very, very conscious of how for, fortunate I, I am. In what many ways, I know that I'm privileged. Well, I, I do think there is a bit of it that comes down to um, you know, parliaments themselves in terms of, you know, it's all very well for parties to say that they want to change the diversity, but I think sometimes finance can be an issue in relation to that. So I think there is a, a sort of, there is for me, part, our democracy itself needs to, needs to do more around that. And then I think there is a larger debate to have around the funding, the funding of our, our, our politics. So, you know, we've had uh, over recess after the release of the Russia report, we've had uh, the new peers going to the House of Lords and lots of talk about donations, etc. But actually, if we want if we want political parties not to be going cap in hand and potentially not and going to people that we don't like or approve of, we have to ask ourselves how we how we how we fund that politics. But I definitely think um, you know we should be looking at sort of bursaries. I think the intern program, which you know I hope to support, say post COVID in the future, is is definitely part of that because you've said there for women. I think finances and how you do it is part of it but I think actually believing that you can you'll, you'll have read in one of the articles Kez, that my father said something along the lines of when you were getting involved in all this politics stuff I thought you were off your heat and then I see those Egypts in the telly and I think you can be just as good as them <laughs> I think it was, and, and I think it was a compliment but I suppose there is a truth to it from the perspective of you know politicians are just people you know Yes, I think you and I know that, know that is true, but the public's perception can be can be really very different of that. So you, you win your seat uh, in December of last year. I don't know if that feels a lifetime ago now or if it feels quite fresh in your mind, given the extent of events since. But you've only yeah. really had three, four months, probably three once you take out the kind of Christmas holidays to be an MP in any traditional old normal sense of, mm. of the word. What was it like, you know, arriving in Westminster for the first time? I mean, how did how did you how do you make friends? How do you know where to go? What support is available for you when you get there? Yeah, I think this this is something I do feel quite strongly about. I suppose for me, there's like a my aim over the four years is it's almost like a Venn diagram. You know, the skills to be a candidate are not necessarily the skills you need to be an effective elected representative, whether that be an MP, MSP, or indeed councillor. And then there's the bit about being a people manager. Um, and, you know, we know the stories and the reports into bullying harassment at Westminster and data say Holyrood probably isn't isn't immune from that either. Um, and, you know, part of that is because um, we put people, they go through this general election campaign, they get no sleep and then they go to Westminster. They've been handed a brown envelope that gives them details to book their accommodation and, and their travel. And then it's over to them to, to, to re recruit their staff. And I think in the old days, you know, and by old days, I mean pre-emails and, and internet and social media, um, there was a time delay for constituents to get in touch with you because if you didn't have an office and you didn't have a phone, how would they write or, or contact you? But literally the email inbox opens from the day of uh, the, the, that you're elected and starts to fill up. And people, you know, in dire, dire need doesn't stop no matter what time of the year it is. So I think there is a question for us to ask around if that's the right way in which to recruit people, because 
it certainly potentially leads to poorer hiring decisions in, in my view and that might not necessarily help some of the issues that we're, we're trying to untangle from being a good employer perspective. Um, so there's that, but how do you meet people? Well, they did run sort of parliamentary training sessions. So the Dems were in with the, the SNP. So, um, uh, and, but it really is telling you what you need to do rather than people doing it for you, I suppose. And then it's just getting on with it. I mean, the end of that first week after the election, 20th of December, it was actually my birthday uh, and I spent my first day make it voting uh, against the withdrawal agreement. It really was a kind of pinch me. And then what was less unexpected was the flight being delayed and later, going an hour and a half later for dinner that had been unintended. But literally the flight up the road just was, 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 also, was all members of parliament. <laughs> It's surreal, isn't it? Oh, incredibly, incredibly it's surreal. But, um, you know, I, I said this prior to us going live on the broadcast, um, there's no such thing as a new MP. I think Harry, Harry Harman said this, you know, you are the only elected representative that your people, you, your constituents have in this place. So you just have to, to, to get on with it. So you, you arrived in there and I guess what could be politely put as a mixed set of fortunes for your political party more generally because oh yeah yeah just I, yeah i can honestly see that i have never felt genuinely purely happy for my success because i was going on to that stage knowing that joe swinson had lost and also you know stephen gethins was a very effective a, a representative for the constituency plus a nice bloke so you know there's 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 you're pleased with the campaign you've run you're honored but uh, you're conscious of all of those things but part of the product of of joe losing her seat and other things that happened around the country was that not only were you an mp you were instantly on your party's front bench yes absolutely so, i remember having a portfolio I, title is yeah, so I've got, I remember having a conversation with Christine Jardin last year saying, you know, what kind of portfolio might you be interested in? And I said, I want us to be in a position where the parliamentary party is big enough that I don't have to worry about that. But yeah, currently I have uh, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, though I work quite closely with Stephen Farry from the Alliance Party, who are our sister party, Northern Ireland, um, political and constitutional reform, and the Department for International Development, which, as you may be aware, is, uh, is being merged with the Foreign Commonwealth, Wealth Office. So um, whether we maintain that as a distinct portfolio going forward, I'm not sure. Plus, we have obviously our leadership election result this week, so portfolios may change. So um, just to mention for people who are interested, um, our last Power Hour guest was Preet Gill, who's the Labour uh, Shadow Secretary of State for International Development. And you can listen to that Power Hour again on our website. It's available um, just now. So you also sit, though, on the Scottish Affairs Committee. Yes. Um, and that's a select committee in Westminster uh, Environment. Um, can you explain for people who are watching um, today how, what, what the remit of that committee is and how it works or doesn't work with both the Scotland office and the, and the Scottish Parliament? Where does it sit in that kind of Venn diagram of Scottish politics? Yeah, so the Scottish Affairs Select Committee uh, is, there's, so I would say, first of all, it's only one of two spaces that Liberal Democrat MPs have. So, you know, I would argue that we're underrepresented across the Select, select Committees. Um, but uh, it basically, its role is to, you know, look at things from a Scotland perspective. And indeed, um, they advertise for topics that people um, would be interested in the Scottish Affairs Committee looking at. Um, currently, its chair is Pete Wisher of the SNP, as it was in the last session of Parliament. And then there's a mix depend based on the, the number of, of seats that uh, that each party has within the whole parliament. So what I would say is I did have, you know, I have had a lot of correspondence from pro-independent supporters, uh, you know, complaining about the makeup of the committee because there's currently um, only three SNP members on it. And um, for me, I suppose my response is that, well, it's the only select committee where the Conservatives don't actually have a majority, which they do in every other select committee. And second of all, for me, SNP MPs sit on a number of other select committees where, so for example, health and social care, where the issues being discussed are devolved. So I suppose for me as a pro-UK politician, I don't have an issue with any of that because it is appropriate that all parties represented in Parliament have the opportunity to, to have that, the, uh, to have those inputs. Um, 
what we have been looking at in the first instance has been a uh, coronavirus um, and I think it's been a very useful first look back at actions by both the UK and the, and the, uh, and the Scottish Government in relation to actions that have been taken and things that could be improved and we've looked at it not only from um, you know the health the health public health perspective but we've also looked at it from an economic perspective and particularly looked at it from a sector perspective as well so we did a specific session in relation to oil and gas. So can your committee um, conduct inquiries and look at issues regardless of whether they're devolved or reserved? Well, what we're looking at is how the devolved and reserved powers work together in the best yeah. interest of the people of Scotland. That should be the objective. And it won't surprise you to know, I suppose, given the, you know, the current governments that we have and, and their very, you know, the, the, their contradictory aims in some respects, that, uh, that things could work a lot better. And indeed, some of the existing mechanisms, so for example, the GMC, which is the Joint Ministerial Council, where a lot of that engagement should take place that system isn't working or or certainly isn't fit for purpose what the, the most recent quarry found sorry i don't even think it's meeting at the moment no think? no exactly and what certainly happened at the start of the pandemic was meetings were taking place through a uh, cobra and something else they called mix i feel like i'm back in the police all these acronyms um, ministerial implementation groups and so those were where the chorus, you know, the, the engagement was taking place rather than the GMC, which is supposed to be at the, the, the heart of, uh, of how we work with devolution in the UK government. So, yeah, very frustrating. So you had sort of three or four months in the traditional sense of being an MP kind of right at the start, although there's probably nothing traditional about doing that in the context of Brexit and the withdrawal bill and, you know, the whole post-election set up at that time but then the pandemic arrives and, and parliament's basically shut down and MPs are sent back to their constituencies to um, do the best they can in the circumstances that they're faced with but that's taken away a lot of your ability to really settle in and, and, and make alliances and, and pals and friendships whether that be in your own party or beyond it. We've had a first yeah. question from Daniel O'Malley who says you know what, what politicians do you look up to and, and what current MPs in the parliament are you friendly with? I think people are always intrigued to know whether you do have alliances across political parties. It's difficult to say that I've really got to the position where I can even make alliances. What I will say is, you know, there are MPs, there, there are MPs and other parties who I would have a chat with on the benches and um, certainly um, I secured an urgent question in relation to the DFID merger and I've had engagement with Sarah Champion since then um, and we're, we're planning a coffee when, when we're back next week um, and then I suppose it, it's just sometimes has been a couple of those early conferences conversations in the, the TQ there was um, a, a, an ill-fated magazine called The Mace who's who the son of Bill Cash set up and it was planned to be the sort of this vanity fair of politics and uh, there was myself and uh, Alex Davis Jones who's the new Labour MP down in Wales in Pontypridd and uh, we went to the reception because we'd been featured in the first issue of the magazine and it was literally just like all the Brexiteers so it was literally let's drink up and leave <laughs> leave this doesn't feel like our kind of people and and then it just so happens that once you see that person again you've kind of got got that connection and um, so that's yeah it's it's definitely been quite challenging in terms of MPs that I'm impressed with so far I think that's true across all the parties and um, I think from an SNP perspective I've been very impressed with Alison Thewlis I think she is um, very very thorough in terms of her brief and her questionings and um, and she's very very good and um, from a Labour perspective um, I would say that Sarah Champion and I have definitely uh, connected Karen Smith is somebody that I've had good conversations with and then from the smaller parties obviously as I've said we work with Stephen Farry I've also engaged with Claire Hanna um, and there's probably been less so and, and Jim Shannon if you've never heard of Jim Shannon before he's DUP so obviously majority of our politics completely unaligned but he is a perfect gentleman and he is very famous for I mean he's very thorough because basically he speaks in every possible debate so there's always the joke that at the end of the day the 30 minute adjournment debate which is usually a, an MP bringing a local issue so they can get response in the government he will be there and he will intervene on in the adjournment debate you know when he'll so he's, he's but he's um he's he's 
he's always very very polite <laughs> until you mentioned him i was struck by just how many of um the people you mentioned there were women and there is perhaps a sort of sisterhood uh, element to that you, you also mentioned claire hannah we're very hopeful that claire hannah is going to do a power hour with us uh, in, in the coming weeks as well and that'll be um something completely different for us although i was also struck uh, when you said there that when you went to that reception and it was full of brexiteers you, you did a swift about town is there something in the fact that you know you, your husband can be a supporter of of independence, but you can't talk to a Brexiteer? Is that is that a step? No, it, it just wasn't that. It was just the whole atmosphere. You know that kind of. In, I, I am some. My, my family all laugh. I'm, I've never not been able to speak. I've I've always been a bit of a chatterbox. And in the main, you know, I, I get like everybody that we sort of feeling in your stomach. Oh, what will people think? You know, what if I'm I'm sort of standing in the corner but you know when it comes to it I also can do it and, 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 and I always enjoy it but in that it, 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 there was just a I think it was obviously at the time it was as well immediately post the with you know us leaving the, the EU that period all happening and there was just an atmosphere there that I didn't want to be part of not that I don't think you know, we should always be looking to work on a cross party basis. So, you know, the different perspective, you know, there's been people like um, Andrew Mitchell and Desmond Swain who were ministers in DFID and, you know, very against what the government's doing. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to move on to um, some kind of more political topics just shortly, but we've had one question in that relates to our brief chat there about the work of the Scottish Affairs Committee. It's from Graham Downey and he says, how do you manage the split between reserved and devolved issues between yourself and the Lib Dem MSP group and how do you explain to members of the public when you are unable to help them because an issue is either reserved or devolved? So I think part of it is from an MP perspective that um, regardless you can still potentially do, do something about it so you know part of my casework we will be writing to, to, Scot to Scottish ministers I think the challenge is actually potentially more the other way that there's you know when it comes to DUP or home office issues MSPs can't deal with that and they do need to to pass on to their MP but I suppose you know um, my experience during the pandemic is for the majority of my constituency, the MSP is Willie Rennie, um, who's also with my party. Jenny, your partner, uh, Kez, is for the, the wee bit that's uh, not in, in Willie's patch. So I suppose we're having those conversations and we do have a weekly parliamentarians call and you'll not be surprised to hear we've got a WhatsApp group as well. <laughs> The world seems to uh, run on WhatsApp these days, for, for good or for ill, I certainly uh, remember that. So we're just going to move into um, some final sort of political topics I wanted to explore with you. And this is really a, a, an opportunity um, for people to put forward more questions. You really ask about anything at this stage. We're going to try and cover some justice issues, uh, talk about um, electoral reform in the final 20 minutes, and touch also, uh, if we have time, on the Lib Dem leadership race, which I think concludes this week. Is that right? Yeah, um, uh, it closes tomorrow at one o'clock, but the result will be announced on Thursday morning. Okay, so maybe come back to that. But just before we do that, we've got another question which relates to the, the last section. And then um, it's from Elliot Napier, who says, it sounds silly, but a genuine question. How do you remember who everyone is in Parliament? Is there some kind of cheat sheet with all the members' names and faces on it? Yes, Kezia, you've got it. <laughs> I do. It's almost like we... Uh, we planned this. <laughs> we planned this earlier, but we actually didn't plan it earlier. We were just talking about different versions of it. These exist in the Scottish Parliament as well, actually. They're by the lifts. So they're in a private part of the building. They're not for the public. And I think that's largely so politicians can make sure they know who, who's who, because that's particularly embarrassing. In, in a Parliament of 129, um, it, it was bad, but with 649 colleagues, Wendy, it must be an altogether different game. Yeah, and I think, you know, data say it's probably more that as so many things have been impacted by COVID, whereas, you know, we would normally be in the chamber for Prime Minister's questions or indeed a, a statement from the Chancellor or something like that. That's obviously not the case. The current rules are, unless you are speaking in the debate or urgent question or ministerial statement, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be in the chamber. So you're not necessarily sitting. I would say I'm probably better at the Conservative names just because I'm looking at them across across the, the the floor but yeah i was always very impressed right at the start you know the the the, the staff and um, they were they basically i think had ump bingo and um, and they were trying to how many names they could get off and it's impressive how quickly you know you, you appear and they say uh, miss chamberlain so i take my hats off hats off to them i usually remember the ones i don't like <laughs> yeah well let me leave that bit there <laughs> 
So, so just moving on to topics around justice, and I kind of covered that this a little bit at the start, but I want to go back to it um, and explore it a little bit. And it always struck me in a way that it was um, not the most natural party. The Lib Dems aren't seen necessarily as the party of law and order, but you disproportionately turn out um, MPs from police officer base or the other way around. I'm thinking of Mike Crockett, who was the MP in Edinburgh West. There's yourself. And there was also Brian Paddock, who was the... Yeah, Lib he's now in the Lords, yeah. In the Lords, but he was a, um, the Lib Dem mayoral candidate in London um, a, a few years ago. And, you know, I mentioned to you earlier that I was always very drawn and very supportive of, of Lib Dem policies around justice because they were, they were liberal. They, they, they fitted much more at ease with my own views, particularly on things like prisoners voting and restorative justice rather than, than, than prison being purely a, a punishment. These are all really difficult things to argue for in, in a tabloid press. I'm just wondering if you can tell us a, a little bit about how your experience as a police officer informs your politics around justice in the context of being a, a Lib Dem. Or, or would you consider yourself soft on crime? Is that an unfair characterization of, of what Lib Dem policies on this are? Yeah, I, I, I think I'm, I th you know, I think I'm realistic about crime, and I think I'm realistic about the causes of crime as well. And I think, in my experience, and I would go back to my time in child protection in relation to this, is that these issues, whether it be issues that are bringing children, vulnerable children, to the attention of social work, whether it's uh, issues that are bringing a family to the attention of the GP or the uh, health visitor, or indeed, you know, noisy neighbours bringing the police to the door they're never separated you know they're all inter intertwined you know we have a lot of people in our society who have you know complex and chaotic lives and you know some of those uh, lead into coming to the to the attention of of the police and and you know I'd actually also relate it to um, my time in terms of military resettlement because part of that is about um, preparing people to you know enter civilian society, a uh, civvy street having, uh, you know, been in a, a, a very disciplined and, dare I say, it supported environment in that, you know, the, the military have taken care of everything. And just before, I'm obviously not equivoc equivocating either, you know, equivalencing in, uh, either of those things. But I suppose it's a bit for me around what's the purpose of our justice system? If, it, you know, is it about prevention of crime or is it about pun punishment? And, and I am just not convinced that a, an overly penal system is the way that you prevent reoffending. And if you dehumanise people or don't treat them as people, we, we can't be surprised when they don't behave like people or what we would expect from a societal perspective. You're obviously in a very strong position to, to advocate that point of view with 12 years experience of being a serving police officer under your belt. People are going to listen to you more than they might at others, but it's, it's still a hard argument to get across in the media, is it not? Do you find, do you find we talk about justice issues enough, actually? Because I, I feel like that slips hugely off of the agenda. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think we're talking about it. I mean, you know, for example, there we have, the, the Scottish Government have just uh, published um, the redacted report into you know, uh, the football matches, the SFA report into football matches and the use of um, uh, of the legislation uh, there. And I haven't seen it other than through the, the kind of press release that, that uh, Liam MacArthur's office sent out. So, no, I don't think we're, talk we're talking about it enough. Um, and I think we, you know, during, there's no doubt that legislation, both the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament, has given a wide range of powers um, in our response to COVID. And I think, you know, one of the key things for me around um, the police service in the UK as well as in Scotland is is about policing by consent. And I think that is one of the critical factors. And if the police uh, do not follow that uh, ethos, and then you get in, get into difficulties. And, and clearly we have seen that this year in relation to issues such as Black, uh, Black Lives Matter, where we have particular um, community group who do not have that trust in the police and indeed have an expectation that they will be penalised when they engage with the police and and so for me that's you know that that that's really shows a, a real yeah real challenge for our justice system and it's actually for the police and the justice system to, to gain that trust. Just because you touched there on the issue of Black Lives Matters I mean one of the fundamental issues there is about how white the police are uh, across the United Kingdom and obviously the same arguments can be made 
uh, in the United States as well, but it's not just a lack of black, Asian, minority ethnic police officers, it's their inability somehow to progress into the senior ranks of, of the police. Mm -hmm. why, why do you think that is? And, and, and is it going to change in our lifetimes? And what will it take to change that? I think that, you know, and I could even look back at it. So I joined the police in 1999 and, uh, you know, a number of women in, in, se in senior roles. There hadn't been a female chief constable uh, in uh, Scotland at that time. I say that obviously because it was the eight, the eight forces. And so I think there is that bit where, um, and I think we talk about it now, there's an expectation that somebody progresses because of a protected characteristic, not because of not because of their abilities and um, interestingly for me and this goes back to what I was doing in learning development is around unconscious bias but it's almost that beyond unconscious bias so yes you need to make your biases conscious but the other aspect is I think we have got into a place where people are potentially worried about saying the wrong thing so rather than saying the wrong thing and they're just not speaking at all and so I think for me that's another area where there's that you know we, we absolutely need to do more work and, and, ha and have those honest thoughtful conversations. I was we were at canvassing for the first time on Saturday I knocked on a door it was a conversation about trans rights we weren't in the same place absolutely not in the same place but we had a really positive conversation because we had listened to one another and I think that's something that you know, when you talk about a tabloid perspective or any of those things is, is very much been been lost. I just uh, I'm thinking a lot about this just now because I was I was on the radio this morning with Trevor Phillips and um, who used to, to run the Equality Rights Com mm -hmm. um, Commission and he was saying that we're not talking about race and diversity nearly enough even post the beginning of the Black Lives um, Matters kind of focus in the past few months and he says that we need to stop being squeamish about it and be as kind of honest as we possibly can about the reasons why. So my question to you is, you know, just in the context of, of the police, you, you represent the northeast of, of Fife and a big part of it is relatively um, well off communities, but some of it are some aspects of yeah, it. Are yeah, some really hidden pockets of deprivation and assumptions yes. made about it as a constituency. Serious pockets of, of deprivation in your community. And I'm just wondering whether, um, you know, there are any young Asian men in Leaving Mouth, which would be one of the, the poorer parts of your constituency, who would even want to be a police officer, let alone it was something they thought that, that they could achieve. It just seems mm -hmm. so, so far removed. And I just wonder what leaders, whether that be in academia or in politics, can do to, to change that, because that's surely the only way we can address problems like that. Yeah, I think it's very much around role models, isn't it? Um, and that might not necessarily be role models who are police officers, but role models that demonstrate that people can, if they demonstrate the skills, knowledge and abilities, can, can absolutely uh, uh, do that. So, and I think it's also around support mechanisms to get people in. So, you know, I'm conscious that potentially maybe I didn't help the diversity of Police Scotland, but as you can imagine, people leaving the services joining the police was something that they thought about and part of that was supporting them and making sure that we were managing their expectations about say about what was required to to be successful in the recruitment process okay so one more question on justice things and then we'll we'll, we'll talk about uh, electoral reform because i know you're desperate to get to that and so am i so i've had another question in which are uh, what are your views on the unification of the scottish police forces so just for people who don't know this wendy's referenced it a couple of times already there used to be uh, eight police boards in, in, in Scotland and in, in the past, I think, three or four years, they've been unified in, in, into one um, kind of national police force. And I guess our questioners are asking whether you would undo that now or whether you think there's any merit to it. I, I don't. I, so my, my position was that I didn't think a single police force was 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 the way ahead. I certainly felt that, and, and I can see this having worked for the Association of Chief Police Officers, when you have one force with 17,000 officers and, and one force, that's Strathclyde, and, and one force, force with um, with about um, several hundred, which was Dumfries and Galloway, there's definitely an, an, an imbalance. And, and there's an issue around fairness about whether one chief constable, you know, they should have equal places around the table. My view was always that a three force system might have been a better way to do that. And actually, I had some experience of um, a recruitment programme that was being run with Fife, Tayside and Lothian and Borders, which was part of that work to, you know, have a unified recruitment process there. Um, I think it would be very difficult to unpick now, but I think we have seen the legacy of a central police force from the perspective of 
the ongoing issues that we've had, um, both in relation to the leadership of the police service itself, but also in relation to the governance, the SPA, I still don't think you know that 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 organisation is 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 fit for per, fit for purpose. And Susan Deacon obviously was the last sort of permanent chair to resign to say that the structures um, didn't work. For me, policing or the governance of policing is a, is a three-legged stool. And what we had previously with the eight forces was we had the chief constable, we had central government, and we had the, lo the local authority through the police board. And by taking away that local accountability, we've kicked a leg of the stool away. So it's sugarly, basically. That's a, a cracking example. Thank you for that. Um, so moving on to electoral reform, we've only got five minutes left. Um, is the time now to have another go at changing the UK electoral system? I, I was there for, I'm a supporter of PR, I was there for the AB referendum. I voted against it because I thought it was the, the worst option of anything that was presenting itself as proportional uh, at all. And I was worried about losing that link between a member of parliament and their constituency. And did I say it, I was worried about the lack of strong and stable leadership across the, uh, in the UK. So where's <laughs> the appetite for another electoral reform campaign going to come from? So I'm very keen as the spokesperson for my party that it's, you know, the Liberal Democrats have advocated for electoral reform for years and, and it hasn't it hasn't made a difference in fact you know we were obviously in coalition when when the AV re referendum took place so it is about how do we work on a cross-party basis so i've been working with electoral reform society and make votes matter who actually just had a campaign day on saturday and for me i think make votes matter is very you know electoral reform society has much wider remit but make votes matter is purely around introducing a proportional represent, re representative system in relation to the UK Parliament. And I think what's key is the involvement of Labour. Um, you know, the reality is, is a path to victory for Labour in 2024 um, isn't possible without, without without the Liberal Democrats, for example, doing very well, or do you see a decline in SNP support where Labour can capitalise on that? So I think there has to be a realisation from them that that's that, that that's the direction that they should and, and, and need to go. And the politics of place argument for first past the post is, I find, an increasingly anachronistic one. Um, my constituency ends in Leavenmouth down Leaven High Street. So one side of Leaven High Street is mine and the other side is Peter Grant's. That doesn't strike me as the, <laughs> the best dividing line to properly represent that community, which, as you pointed out, has, has a number of, of challenges. And, and actually what the UK government are currently doing, so just for information, the constituencies bill has just passed through the Commons that will maintain 650 seats and the boundary reviews will take place on that. But the key thing for the Conservatives, they want every vote to count equally. And what they mean by that is every constituency to be the same size in terms of number of electors. There's a huge amount of issues with that, whether we talk about people you know, who aren't on the voter registration for a start, those who are more structurally disadvantaged. And also, as we know in Scotland, the huge um, constituencies in terms of geographical size that that, that, would, that that would give us. And actually, I think the government are going to undermine themselves on two fronts here. One is the fact that they're only putting a 5% limit either side. So with 650 seats, that's actually not a big number of people that could potentially, so a very large housing development in one constituency could then knock on into any number of constituencies and create a butterfly effect. And as soon as you start doing that, I think that identifiable communities becomes more difficult to represent in a parliamentary constituency. And then the other thing the government are doing, and, and we're supportive of the principle of removing the 15 year cap on overseas voters being able to vote in UK elections. But what we would like to do is to have overseas constituencies. What the government want to do is just add those people into the constituencies. So they want to do the boundary review, and then they want to add in an unknown people, number of people from overseas before 2024. So there's another it's factor mad. as well, which is differential turnout. So you, um, and this was this was my dissertation topic on my masters. So I'm a, no, a, bit, a bit geeky about this stuff. Is but the difference in turnout in some UK constituencies can be 35 percent. Yeah, absolutely, like, absolutely. In Bartonshire, I think was maybe you know 81 percent in an election. You've got some, and this is just in Scotland. It could be different across the UK. Um, some Glasgow constituencies just sneak over the 50% mark. So if you're mm -hmm. going to try and balance out the size of the constituency based on the number of people that live within it, surely you've got to yeah. factor in the likelihood and of 
Okay. Yeah, and that's the people that are only on uh, only on the voter list. Surely, one of the better ways to do it is you still have defined areas, but you have a uh, multiple number of representatives. I'm very conscious of the fact that you know my majority means that the majority of people in North East Fife didn't vote for me, but I'm now their single representative that they go to. That just doesn't that doesn't seem seem right. Does that change the way that you operate? changes the way I would operate on a local level because um, you know constituency case work is, is something that I feel very passionate about and, and I suppose I've spoken about that in terms of my previous uh, background but um, uh, I think and, and maybe it's back to husband SNP member as well but I, it definitely for me is about not not being overly strident and, and you know just trying to listen and, and, and hear people and ultimately obviously agree to disagree uh, on, on some key key issues but I think one of the big things for me is you know constitutionally and otherwise we've got ourselves into really binary sets of circumstances and that's just not life. Yeah that's never a truer word uh, has been said. Wendy, we are almost out of time, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you one more question, but I need a short answer from you because I think everybody's desperate to know who who's gonna win the Lib Dem leadership race and um, what's the difference between the two candidates? Just in sixty seconds, Max, if you can. Okay, so I'm sporting Leila. I think it's gonna be very close, so I'm not gonna commit to saying who I would think would win. <laughs> but I would also say that as a party, we pride ourselves on our um, members deciding our policy. So in many ways, in fact, 95% of the ways, I would say that Ed and Leila are very similar and I enjoy working with both of them very much. Uh, the reason I'm supporting Leila is because I think that her profile um, and the work that she's done recently, she's got a much greater degree of cut through and when going forward you put her against Johnson, Starmer, Blackford in, in, in the House of Commons and, uh, and uh, Leila she'll, she'll, she'll stand out and I think we need to take some risks given where we are currently. Great, thank you for that very succinct answer, I really appreciate that. Wendy that's been absolutely fascinating, we, we hugely appreciate your time, we've covered so much ground uh, over the past hour, it's really really, really enjoyable. Everybody who's on this call um, in fact, we've had one person already say thank you both uh, very much. It's been very interesting and enlightening. I should have just read that out instead. Um, as soon as we end this meeting, there will be an evaluation uh, opportunity for everybody who's tuned in to tell us uh, what you thought of tonight's event, um, what you might like to improve for future events, and also an opportunity to suggest future speakers. So please do take a moment to fill that out. The next Power Hour event is on the 22nd of September and we will be joined by Torsten Bell, who is the director of the think tank, the Resolution Foundation, who um, were the creators of the furlough scheme and uh, they are the main think tank for living standards issues across the country. So we'll have a really interesting conversation with uh, them about how they try to influence government policy uh, for the better. So join us on the 22nd of September. How to register for that event is already on the John Smith Centre website, which is johnsmithcentre.com. Thanks to our guest, Wendy. We wish you well. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. Good night. Bye-bye.